Hey everybody, quick disclaimer before we get started. We had a little recording malfunction uh, and all of my audio is being recorded just straight from the microphone on my computer. So uh, it's not up to our usual standards, but it's still pretty good. I think you're still going to like it. It's still a very funny and fun episode. Uh, so without further ado, please enjoy. Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, use the force, Mario. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined as I am always joined by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. How's it going, Mark? It's going good. You know, I wonder, normally we, um, you know, sometimes our cold opens are really like non sequiturs. They're out there. Yeah. And I never feel the need to explain them. But I'm wondering, like, the connection between mm. our cold opens for these episodes yes. and, like, the topic itself is so tenuous. I don't know exactly like what to do, but I don't know that it matters. I think I I trust that people are finding the connection between Nintendo sci-fi mm -hmm. and and like, use the Force Mario. I think they're I think they're <laughs> getting it. I think that combines sci-fi and Nintendo. And last week it was Beam Me Up Mario. Um, yeah. I think people get the connections. I think they groan when they hear it. For, first, they're probably confused. Then they groan when they understand it. Um, and uh, everyone has a a, a great time. I think that's probably true. Speaking of which, I want to hear about um, what's up with the Sonic Forces borrowing program. Oh, okay. So, uh, yes. Speaking of things that will make you groan at first, and then you'll be confused. Um, the Sonic Forces borrowing program is live. It is back in action after being on a uh, several-month hiatus. Um, and I realized that before we went before we like went into quarantine and like I enacted the hiatus um, actively um, that it had been out on like one long journey from like December to like um, you know February sometime so the game has really only gone out like once in the last year or so which made me go okay Patrick you got to start from scratch here uh, you got to go back into all of the emails that reference Sonic in the Nintendo Cartridge Society email address, which of course, if you would like to borrow my copy of Sonic Forces, all you gotta do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail.com. Gmail.com. And give us a mailing address so we can send it. Um, so I went back and I reconstituted a full list to make sure that I wasn't missing anyone. Mark, I have missed some people. So uh, I have contacted a handful of people from uh, over a year ago um, at this point. Uh, to see if they are still interested in borrowing the copy of Sonic Forces. Um, I believe it is going to be going out to uh, Cassidy next. Um, so uh, Cassidy's getting that. Everyone else who has uh, submitted um, your addresses already, I have them. You are on a list. The list is good and strong and better than ever. Um, but do get on that list because you're going to want to borrow this copy of Sonic Forces. <laughs> uh, it's going back on the road uh, on... Or by the time people are listening to this, it will be back on the road. Uh, it is a perfect borrowing program. It'll be supporting the post office, of course. Um, I'm very excited to see it back in action again. Yeah, me too. And really, you know, we talk all the time about how the Sonic Forces borrowing program is the perfect program. That's right. And, you know, things just seem to work out with the Sonic Forces borrowing program because you did go back and reconstitute the list. And so that means that the list previously was imperfect, which I don't want to say was the cause for the pandemic, mm. but it well, might have been no, the universe. That is interesting. It, it, it might have been the universe not letting the Sonic Forces Borrowing Program continue until the list could be perfected, thus, thus continuing its streak as the perfect program. So you're suggesting that COVID-19 is some sort of autoimmune system for the world because it saw that it was beset by... Uh, an oncoming uh, plague of the Sonic Forces borrowing program is operating incorrectly. Shut everything down for up to five months, plus however long we have left of this, uh, just so I would get frustrated, check the list, fix the list. It's a sound theory. It's, it is a theory. The alternative is that uh, the Sonic Forces borrowing program is perfect, but mm. the list is not. 
Yes, uh, yes. Well, and I administer the list, and I will admit that I am not perfect. So that's <laughs> that's why we're here. Look, we are but servants of a perfect program, right? We are doing our best true. to enact its that's will. Right. Um, that's right. You know, you can't get mad at a religious person for interpreting the, the scripture incorrectly. Can you? You probably should. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all right. Uh, but everyone should submit to that and um, get on the list. Borrow this someday. Uh, there are 30 names on the list right now of people who are still waiting to borrow this thing. So it will be a while. Um, Mark, in the meantime, though, we've got uh, we've got an email from our friend, Daniel, who basically we dared to play Octopath Traveler to its completion. And Mark, I'm happy to tell you that he has finished all eight character stories. And he sends us an email with uh, Octopath Traveler spoilers. I will read the email. However, I will not reveal the spoilers that are in here. So no one needs to worry about uh, big spoilers for Octopath Traveler. Daniel writes, Hi, Mark and Patrick. I'm writing this email from the safe room at the end of the final first Final Destination movie, so the curse can't claim me before I hit send. Uh, then he goes on to explain the endings of Tressa and Ulberic. Um, and then, now for the serious business. As suspected, there is a post-game. It's awesome. It ties together all eight stories. It draws on mythology that has been tantalizingly hinted at throughout the adventure. It involves the aforementioned evil cult, a war between gods, and generations of powerful sorcerers. And it's all buried in side quests. When I beat Ulbricht's path, I was foaming at the mouth with anticipation for any indication of a post-game. A cutscene, a dialogue box, a new icon on the world map. I got nothing. I backtracked it through a few towns. Nothing. I cleaned up as many side quests as I could. Nothing. Finally, with a heavy heart, I assumed that there actually was no post-game, but I fired up the wiki just to be sure. Treachery! I was so completely gut-punched. The true ending to the game, which rules, isn't even part of the main game. So much so that the game gives you no indication whatsoever that continuing to play after wrapping all eight paths will pay off in any way. You would never find the true ending unless you were a hardcore completionist and all the more power to them, but that's just, uh, but that's just not most gamers and it's definitely not me. This really kind of broke my heart. I put 120 hours into this game and sincerely enjoyed most of it, but I am out of gas. I'm ready for a change of scenery, and I can't justify being forced to slog through every tedious side quest as a prerequisite to tackle the narrative conclusion, no matter how cool it sounds. And it sounds so cool! Uh, and then he gives an example of why it sounds so cool, which I am going to leave out because it is uh, super spoilery. Uh, there's so much to appreciate this game for, and I'm really glad I stuck with it for as long as I did, but for a game so preoccupied with betrayal, I couldn't help but think the game itself is the ultimate traitor. On a brighter note, I've decided that I'm going to start A Link Between Worlds next, which I know has the NCS seal of approval. Thank you for letting me take you all on an absolute ride, and as always, looking forward to future episodes. Daniel. That is amazing. Also, it do, the content does sound so cool, and it sounds so cruel that they're hiding it behind all of the uh, side quests. Yeah. Like, no, why do that? Well, and making it... I mean, the, the one thing that that does solve, right, is the sort of, like, constant complaint uh, for games like that where, like, the side quests don't matter, you know? Um, that, like, when you do side quests, when, like, if you are really trying to complete everything, that, like, you'll finish the game by, like, finding someone's four chickens, right? And, like, that'll be it. That'll be the last <laughs> thing you do, and nothing matters. Um, but, like, if the side quests all add up to something meaningful, like, I just got the Platinum Trophy in uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, right? And the last thing I did to unlock that trophy was kick a goat that had kicked me first. So I had to just, like, go and, like, hang out by a goat, wait for it to kick me and then kick it back that's how i ended that game right <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i uh um i guess that is that is a good point i guess that's better potentially than because i think like the alternative okay the ultimate example that i'm thinking of where i was like man am i glad i did not do the side quest is in uh arkham knight um batman arkham knight and it has all like the Riddler puzzles. And if you want to get the quote true ending of the game, 
you have to complete all of like the Riddler puzzles, but the Riddler puzzles were not to me fun at all. And so like, I did not want to complete it. But even if you spent all the time to complete it and to get the true ending, it's like a 15 second cutscene <laughs> that is not like very interesting or compelling. Yeah. And like, that's the reward. So at least in this instance, like the reward is some really cool sounding like end game content because it does sound really cool yeah yeah um and that that is heartbreaking and uh, man those arkham uh those riddler trophies are a really good example of something where you're like it's fun to get like 75 percent of them you know or like somewhere between 50 and 75 uh and then <laughs> like the last little bit where you're just like well i just have to look up how to find every single one of them. like there's nothing there's no there's no fun here it's just me like executing a checklist yeah, but uh, Daniel, thank you so much for uh, sharing like your journey with us. And also, congratulations on finishing Octopath Traveler. I think you are the first person. Yeah, first person probably in the world, although I will put forth that in completing all eight paths, you did not complete the game. It sounds like you're walking <laughs> away with stuff still left to be no, done. No, I, I was leaving that part out. I was leaving... <laughs> that unsaid do we do officially absolve you of the responsibility to complete that part of the game finishing all eight paths is uh, astounding and i have not you're the first person i've known to do that so <laughs> a very nice work all right mark uh we started on something last week that we ran out of time and couldn't finish so we are going to finish it this week we are doing the abcs of nintendo sci-fi let's get into it <laughs> Mark, last week we did A through M, uh, the letters A through M, the first 13 letters of a 26-letter alphabet. Um, this time we will address N through Z, the final 13 letters of the alphabet. Um, would you like to start or would you like me to start with our, uh, with our letter N? Um, I will go ahead and start. And my goal through this is yes. to remember which one of us needs to go next because <laughs> last week i really struggled with that so that is my hope so i will start with n um okay, and good. my n is the near future Ooh. of 2007 um which is the opening for or is when sin and punishment takes place no way the near yeah, future so, 2007 <laughs> yes and so there's two things i love about this one yeah. like sin and punishment it, is a um, game developed by Treasure, published by Nintendo, I believe, didn't make it to the U.S. until um, it was published on the Wii Virtual Console, and it's it's a uh, like um, an on rail shooter basically, um, featuring like a brother and a sister who are like fighting to save the Earth from destruction. Sure. Um, and uh, so I I bought the uh, game when it came to the Wii Virtual Console, and like totally like on rail shooters I'm not great at and totally did never beat it. Um, there was a sequel that was actually released on the Wii sin and punishment star successor, which I don't know. Did you, did you ever play it Patrick? No, I've never played either of these games, but the, the thing I like about it and the reason why like the near future of 2007 really sparks my imagination is because uh, I think there's just something fun about living past like that time um, it reminds me of, do you, did you ever watch Thundar the Barbarian? Ooh, yes, but don't ask me any follow-up questions. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, so I saw it on, like, Cartoon Network, but it must have been made in, like, the 60s or 70s. And, like, the whole premise that every episode begins with is that, like, a planet, in the year, like, 1994, a planet... Um, uh, traveled between the Earth and the Moon, throwing off like the Earth's gravitational force, and it caused like all this destruction. Cool, and, I love you know, it. Like stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And so it was as a kid, it was so much fun to be like, "Ooh, in the year 1994," and that's a um, that's the year I'm living in now. And that is uh, that's like something that's th that the joy of that has never gone away. There's something like that's fun about that, almost like retro futurism of people being like, "This is what we think is going to happen." Uh, I mean. Not that they're really 
uh they're not prognosticating right. <laughs> yes especially with something like that where the moon's gravitational pull messes something up. It's just, <laughs> i mean it's just like a, a terminator or like terminator 2 and like seeing is it like the year 2000 or something where like uh, skynet becomes aware and like uh starts a war on humanity like it's just it is cool to like be on the other side of that and be like whoo <laughs> guys we're well, okay it's just, <laughs> well i so like i remember being in like elementary school and you know, when you were thinking into the far future, when cities were planning in the far future, yeah. everything was like Vision 2020. In the year 2020, you know, like, what is our city going to look like? How are we going to have transformed our city? And so, you know, obviously everybody was super far off and we're in the year 2020 and things feel pretty much the same. But I, but like, you know, looking ahead now where it's like, yeah, wow, 2050, that seems so far away. <laughs> it's true it's true and it's just 2050 is really not that far away <laughs> um but that's great uh i i, I love the uh, near future year 2007 feels just like um something taking place in the year uh 20x or 20xx yeah um, totally the Mega Man games would do that uh yeah it's all and you know now we're just like yeah we're just past that like 20 20x <laughs> is now 10 years ago you know at, at the very least <laughs> Um, my N, Mark, uh, I'm going with, uh, a protagonist from a role-playing game series. I'm going with the Elliot to Earthbound's, uh, wait, the E.T.'s, the Elliot, the, the boy. <laughs> I'm going with Ness. I'm going with Ness from Earthbound. He's the protagonist of the game. He has a very Elliot from E.T. vibe to him where he is just a regular suburban kid who, like, just has access to regular suburban stuff. He's like a quintessentially Gen X, um, like latchkey kid, right? Like his dad is never home. His mom is like there, but kind of out of it. Um, and like, he's just sort of off living his life. Um, and that's such a like cool, uh, like type of character that you saw so much in like the films of the eighties. Um, but not really in games. Like, you know, Earthbound was, like, at the time, like, hailed as, uh, you know, having such a, um, you know, like, mundane premise or, like, such a, you know, a, a sort of um, everyday starting point, especially, like, you know, everyday, uh, like, American sort of starting point. Um, and, yeah, it's just, it's still sort of, like, one of the only games that has that sort of, like, milieu to it. And it's all, like, you know, around Ness. Because all the other characters in Earthbound are, like you know, weird eccentrics and like, you know, just like, all right, okay, so here's this, uh, you know, nerdy kid with a bowl cut who's also a super scientist. Um, you know, like all the rest of the characters are uh, like outrageous and out there and Ness is just like a regular dude. Yeah, and that's also just kind of like, uh, well, I was gonna say like, I feel like that like trope of like the latchkey kid, like, I don't know, I assume like latchkey kids exist in some and maybe we should explain what a lat when when we say like latchkey kid like what that sure means. um that uh, a latchkey kid ooh I just bit my tongue a latchkey kid uh is you know primarily uh members of Generation X or people who were um raised in the uh born in the late seventies or early eighties maybe even all the way up through like the mid eighties um who uh both their parents worked which was a you know a new con new social construct at the time um so when you would come home from school you either just had a key or you had access to a key to let yourself into the house and then you were left unsupervised for hours at a time uh, until your parents came home from work um and a lot of like latchkey kids and gen xers have like you know memories of being uh left alone for long stretches and preparing meals for themselves uh, when they're very young, it's sort of like the babysitterless generation, um, which I know, like I'm a little bit on on the cusp of. Um, you know, my uh, my mother went back to teaching um, when uh, shortly after my brother was born, so I was like seven or eight, and like from then on, you know, yeah, you know, we would come home from school and have to like hang out um, by ourselves until you know our parents were home at like six or seven or whatever. Yeah, it's like it's a really specific. Um... Yeah, I, th I feel like it was just, like, at a really specific time, like you were saying, like, both parents were uh, beginning, were working, which was different than it had been in generations past. And now I, like, I genuinely don't know, like, do, are, do latchkey kids exist? Do, 
today like is it I, just I feel more... like the I feel like the re the reaction to it has been so strong that like the former latchkey kids the Gen Xers have become helicopter parents right like mm. that the pendulum has swung so far in the other direction and I mean who knows a helicopter parent is a term that you know that the genesis of that is like 15 years ago so you know, <laughs> <laughs> look we don't have neither of us have kids right so no I don't know I don't that's genuinely <laughs> what I was asking what do kids do nowadays that's basically what I was asking <laughs> Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, but so N- Ness is that. And then also, you know, he has obviously gone on to have a much higher profile than uh, just the protagonist of a uh, Super Nintendo RPG. He got that Smash Brothers he, bump. He's got that Smash Brothers bump. And even with like Lucas in, uh, you know, Smash Brothers Ultimate and, you know, the other versions of the game, like it's Ness people want to play, right? Like he is, uh, he is Earthbound. He is the Mother series. Uh, all right, uh, so that's N. My O, um, now, suddenly, topical. Wouldn't have been topical last week. I'm going with Olimar. I'm also going with Olimar. <laughs> Yay, it's a good solid O. Um, I- interestingly, though, uh, Olimar is not, he is normally the main character of the uh, Pikmin series. Uh, and while he does appear in Pikmin 3, and will therefore also appear in Pikmin 3 Deluxe, he is not the main character. You play as Louie for the most part. Um, and collect uh, Brittany and another guy um, before eventually stumbling upon Olimar. Um, but Olimar is the OG. He's, you know, uh, he's got that big nose. He's wearing a spacesuit. He's tiny, or he lands on planets where everything is huge. I'm not, it's not clear to me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I like we talked about on Tuesday, Olimar and Pikmin in general is like a series that has all, I've just never really experienced, which I don't know. I feel like it's like a like a B tier Nintendo series, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. But it has like infrequent appearances. And uh, I mean, but uh, Olimar for me totally is like a Smash Brothers thing. Just like my introduction, you know, to like so many Fire Emblem characters and all that kind of stuff. Like yeah. my introduction to Olimar is through Smash Brothers. Olimar also has that uh, quality that like that that uh, that sense of like isolation or being stranded. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different from the Samus Aran vibe, right? Like Samus is always alone in, in Metroid games until they screw him up and she's not alone. Um, but like Olimar has that like almost lost in space quality to him or almost, um, is it an interstellar where there's someone who's been like hanging out on a planet for a long yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Matt Damon. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, w- which is also uh, The Martian. Are those the same movie? <laughs> <laughs> but but I think your point is well taken that Olimar is the Matt Damon of the Nintendo universe. Um, which yeah. I think is indisputable. Mm-hmm. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my P, moving on, is uh, Pokeballs. Oh. Now, I don't know. I, I think Pokemon is a quietly sci-fi series. Um, Clearly, it is taking place in, like, an Earth-like planet, mm-hmm. but it is not Earth. Their technology is different from ours. Um, I would say more advanced, um, but also, like, the Pokeball itself is a very, like, sci-fi construct, right? Um, or maybe it's not, I mean, sci-fi slash I Dream of Genie. But basically, <laughs> you know, you're using this, mm-hmm. like, has to be, like, mechanical or electronic in some sort of way. It's magic. I don't know what it is, but seemingly scientific way to like capture these Pokemon. They exist in the ball and then you're able to like release them and they're totally happy to like passing between those two states. And I mean, the, the, yeah, Pokemon is, is weird in this regard because like you sort of have to believe that the Pokemon are animals, right? That they are biological creatures in some regard. Um, But you definitely like, turn them into light and energy you turn them into photons and suck them into this like little spherical flashlight and then you upload them to a computer or something Um, (laughs) like it is it's it's wild stuff and so like what what is real what is the pokeball doing you know is it absorbing the consciousness and memories of the pokemon and then vaporizing its body and then storing that information so it can 3d print it again later like what's happening there yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it's like um right like uh the in Star Trek when they're being like beamed up and yes. beamed down, they're not it, it is basically doing that. It's like breaking them down and then like rebuilding a completely new 
version of them. Um, and yeah, like Pokemon. So that that is interesting, Patrick, because you know you take them to the Poke Center to get or Pokemon Center to get healed, and they put the ball in like the incubator. Yeah. But maybe really what they're doing is just like when you like charge your phone, um, right? Like it's just yeah. like taking the consciousness of these animals and then like you know uh, filling them up. Yeah, just uh, just erasing the uh, their memories of being damaged. That's all they're all, <laughs> all it's doing. It's all very Gattaca. It is very Gattaca. Or almost, it's almost a little The Matrix. Is mm-hmm. it possible mm-hmm. that uh, the characters in Pokemon are in The Matrix? Uh, yeah, totally. It is <laughs> totally possible. <laughs> For my P, Mark, I'm going a little bit esoteric here. I am choosing Professors Hector and Vector from Gyromite and Stack Up. Now, I love it. These are the scientists who are possibly responsible for the creation of Rob the Robot in universe. Um, Rob the Robot for people who are not older than dirt like you and I, um, probably only know him as uh, a character in Smash Brothers, right? But he w- was not really a character in a game so much as a peripheral toy that Nintendo used to get their products into toy stores and take up shelf space um, after the video game bust of uh, whenever E.T. came out, 1984 or something. Um, and, uh, you know, they needed to convince uh, stores to carry their thing and that they weren't selling a video game, that they were selling a toy. And so there was a, you know, foot and a half, two foot tall robot that came with your NES that would spin little tops and put the tops on uh, on an NES controller to depress the buttons. Um, and you would use them in two games, Gyromite and Stack Up. I've never played Stack Up. I don't know what it's like at all. Um, but that's where Professor uh, Hector is from. Professor Vector is from Gyromite. Um, and I have played that game a tiny bit. Um, and you are controlling uh, Professor Vector moving around uh, this screen. And you ha- sort of have to wait for your Rob the Robot to depress different buttons on that controller to open up gateways. Now, if you just have a friend who can push the buttons without spinning tops, <laughs> you can cheat the system pretty easily and the game's not that hard. Um, but uh, getting to play with your friend Rob, R-O-B, the robot, um, you can only do that because these two mad super scientists, professors Hector and Vector, put him together for you. Um, next, my Q is Q Games, which is the stu- uh, Dylan Cuthbert studio. Um, and Dylan Cuthbert, of course, uh, worked on a, a lot of Nintendo games, but famously uh, did a lot of um, Star Fox 2 before it was canceled. Um uh, well, I guess did it, and then the game never came out. Um, uh, and Q Studios um, developed uh, Star Fox Command, the DS version um, of Star Fox that put a lot of the uh, sort of like strategy elements of um, Star Fox Two, um, like actually put them into a, a, a game. Um, so yeah, Q Q Games is is my poll for Q. That's that's really good. Dylan Cuthbert, I think, also was involved with like the original Star Fox. And yeah, the game, right. I think it was called X on Game Boy, because I think that he was um, one of the people who was foundational for the FX chip. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, it, it, which is still sort of magic to me, and especially um, X, which is a game I've never played, but um, is a Game Boy game that is effectively displaying polygons, which is surreal um, that that hardware would be able to do that at all is just uh, uh, mind-blowing. Um, so, uh, you know, well, the studio, uh, didn't, uh, you know, when it actually, uh, came to be only really did, um, Star Fox Command for Nintendo, and then they developed a few other titles, um, uh, not exclusively for, uh, Nintendo platforms. Uh, Star Fox Command is a, a big enough presence, and just like the S, the, uh, Super FX chip is also such a, uh, weird revolutionary thing, um, for the, uh, SNES that I just want to give them a shout out here. Yeah, great. My cue is questionable rumors. Mm. Um, so <laughs> we talked about we talked about last week. My eye for a Nintendo Sci-Fi was internet favorites because I think you know, like Metroid, F Zero, Star Fox. These are all like fan favorite games that I would argue don't really have a purpose or a place um, in Nintendo's current lineup. 
uh, outside of Metroid, maybe. I think they just don't really know what to do with it. And um, But because they are fan favorites, they are the foundation for so many just, like, fan rumors. Um, like Star Fox Racers, which oh, uh, yeah. was a rumor not that long ago that I still think is a great idea, which is basically like, hey, do you, can you make, like, an F-Zero type game but using Star Fox characters? Um, like, yeah, that sounds super fun. There was like a Metroid and a Star Fox crossover game that was rumored for the Wii U era. Um, this one is seemingly not a rumor. Potentially, it was a game that was being worked on at some point, but Metroid Dread, yeah. um, uh, 2D Metroid for the DS era. And then the ever-present rumor that uh, Metroid Prime Trilogy is hanging over us all like the Sword of Damocles um, being released, uh, potentially being released for Switch any day now. Uh, yeah, like, I, I feel like there's so much love for these series that it's, um, people love making up rumors and then posting them on the internet about what these series could become. Absolutely. Well, and I think that there is something to, um, like, the spark of imagination behind these things, right? The, uh, that there is always, like, the promise, there, there's always, like, an inherent mystery, right? Or, like, something that you want to have more information about, um, that like isn't totally present in uh, a lot of the other Nintendo stuff. Like you don't you don't have serious follow up questions about Donkey Kong or about Mario. <laughs> like we'll joke about like is Donkey Kong Cranky Kong's son? Is Cranky Kong the original Donkey Kong? Who's Diddy Kong? Why does he have a tail? Um, but like these aren't questions that we actually. <laughs> they're not real questions. But like, do we want to know more about uh, the Lilat system? You bet we do. Do we want to know more about like Metroids and the Galactic whatever? Like, we get one hundred percent. Um, it's all very, um, it all promises that there is more. Uh, and if anyone like sniffs more, um, they're gonna try to articulate it. Yeah, absolutely. And th I also think that like, um, we always just want what we don't have. Yes. You know, we see it every year after an E3 presentation. Instead of talking about like the stuff that was released, we're immediately like, but what is this? What is this year's E3 presentation that ended 30 seconds ago mean for next year's E3 presentation? Fans are the worst, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so next is R, and my R is Robobot Armor. Um, from Amazing. the Kirby game. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Kirby's an interesting series just because, like, you don't really think of it as sci-fi, and I don't know that... I, like, it's not really sci-fi, but it just goes to bonkers places. Like, Kirby yeah. can well, we talked do... we talked last week about uh, Kirby bosses being, like, a, a, an element of hard sci-fi in Kirby. Yeah, and it seems like, like, Kirby games follow the same sort of like thread where they start in dreamland and it's all like real nice and cute and what you imagine Kirby to be. And then it ends up in some like completely gonzo place. And, uh, but like, I like that Kirby is a character that you can like, I feel like a lot of Nintendo's characters are really strong in this way where like, yeah, Mario can be in space. Mario can be wherever, um, you know, like Kirby's the same sort of way. You're like, yeah, I mean, what is Kirby anyway? So yeah, it can go wherever it wants. Uh, and, and the Robobot armor is, of course, from uh, Kirby and Planet is it just Robobot. Is that I think it's, it's I think it's Planet Robobot. Hey, are there girl Kirby's? Are there other Kirby's? Is Kirby like this is a the great last? question? Uh, so there uh, is it Prince Fluff, the other playable character in um, Kirby's Epic Yarn. He's like a blue Kirby. Mm. I might I might be getting his name wrong, but I, what's interesting about Kirby is that there are so many games that uh, so many multiplayer Kirby games that just make everyone play as Kirby. So I don't I don't know. I think uh, <laughs> Kirby is Legion. I think is my <laughs> is is my my statement on that. Um, Mark, for my R, I went with and this. Mind you, I have been playing uh, F Zero GP Legend on uh, the GBA on my Wii U uh, lately, so I'm picking a character from there. This is Rick Wheeler. Um, Rick Wheeler is the first character that they let you play as in the story mode, um, and it slowly kind of like doles out to you what his history is, which is not so because uh, the the main villain in the game is named Zoda which, yes, it's the same as the villain from Star Tropics. Um, they're different characters, but they have the same name. <laughs> um, and uh, so 
Rick Wheeler is a detective who has been on the trail of Zoda. Um, but the thing, the twist here is that he's been on Zoda's trail for 150 years. How can that be true? Well, 120 years ago, he was chasing after Zoda. Um, and the last thing he remembers is crashing his car. And then, and then 120 years later, wakes up and is still chasing Zoda. So, like, he's I, got a real demolition I hate when that man going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a real demolition man uh, scenario, right? That like uh, this was his villain in the past, uh, and he did his best to fight him, uh, failed in whatever capacity, and then has to fight him again in the future. Um, and this is the sort of uh, insanity that uh, F Zero GP legend uh, like staples onto the tried and true F Zero <laughs> formula, uh, and I love so it. it is he a char- so is he is this story I don't know if you know is this story and like these characters are they taken from the anime? I think so. I think the mm-hmm. game story is based on the anime, but I I have I have no idea. Um is this guy a bounty hunter? No, he's like a legit detective. I mean again, oh. this is just like Demolition Man. So he was a cop hunting. He was Sylvester Stallone. Uh, you know, it, it, trying to fight fight the bad guy in the past. Uh, as yeah, as I'm, like a legit cop, Wesley Snipes. I, I have, couldn't I'm, think of who it was. Well, I, I'm gonna be honest. I remember the Taco Bell tie-in with that movie more than I remember the movie. In the future, so. all restaurants are Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that part of Vision 2020 turning out to be true. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, so that uh, that's uh, um. I, I would love to uh, spend more time just like learning about the Rick Wheeler experience. That is something that could be its own game. Um, j- just like, you know, we would like to see uh, uh, Captain Falcon like go in on his bounty hunting ad- adventures. I'd love to see uh, Rick Wheeler, you know, time cop try, just trying to get his man 150 <laughs> years later. R- Rick, Rick Wheeler is such a used car salesman name. Um, mm. But the Rick, the Rick Wheeler experience Great name for like a video game music cover band. Yeah, like a prog rock video game cover band. Absolutely. You play a ton um, of uh, uh, F Zero music. Wait, are you up next or am I up next? I'm up next because I haven't done my S yet. No, well, neither have I. Oh, of course, because Rick I, Wheeler, I, not, <laughs> not an S. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're up. But you did up. your R, right? Yeah, you did Robobot. I, I did. Up next. I did, yes. <laughs> my S is SR388, um, which is the planet in uh, Metroid 2 in the Metroid universe that is home to the Metroids. Um, So its primary function in uh, the Metroid games is that's where you go to hunt down the Metroids to extinction, um, only to discover that there is one baby one that kind of likes you, and so you spare it um, and inflict that pain on the galaxy forever. I love, 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 love uh, how much Metroid is uh, just the Alien series and even takes sort of the naming convention of... uh, Because in Aliens, it's um, LV-426. And in uh, Metroid, it is SR-388. Um, I love it. Uh, that, that planet is, seems like a nightmare, uh, in both franchises, um, <laughs> with or without the horrible killer alien monsters on it. Um, and I've always been sort of charmed by the idea of SR388 as the, like, Genesis tub for, um, for, for the Metroid. I wish we would go back there in the series. So my S is just for the Sin and Punishment series. Um, I pretty much had all I had to say about it when I talked about the near future of 2007. Um, but uh, yeah, shout out to one of those like weird Nintendo franchises that you forget exists. And uh, I- I'm assuming they have some sort of representation in uh, Smash Brothers as like a trophy well, or something. That's a good question, yeah. Um, would you uh, someday ever go back and play Sin and Punishment 2? Hmm. Remind me the name of the title because it was funny. Uh, Star Successors. Star Successors. God, that's good. <laughs> I, you know what? I, um, given the opportunity, I would check it out for sure. My T, because it is my turn, and I know that, is uh, Tatanga from Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2 in a little cameo role. Mark, mine too. Mine too. 
Tatanga, of course, is is a straight up alien, a dude in a UFO, mm-hmm. and like an old fashioned like UFO looking UFO. Uh, mm-hmm. There is no mistaking that he like look. He appears on a Game Boy, uh, so there's no color involved, but you can tell he's a little green man, right? Like he is the <laughs> prototypical alien. Yeah, and you know, like we are Wart stands on this show. Huge you know, Wart we stand. love and support Wart from mm-hmm. um, Super Mario Brothers too. But uh, you know, Wart is still sometimes getting official Nintendo art. I feel like Tatanga. Um, yes. it you know, it is time for us all to rally around Tatanga. I would love to see more Tatanga out in the universe. And uh, boy, is it a fun name to say. And also, like, let's not you know. Let's not say like, oh, well, it was a Mario Land game. It was one of the weird Game Boy spinoffs, so we don't have to like count it or deal with it. That's where Daisy comes from. That's where (laughs) Wario comes from. Like, let's put the same respect on Tatanka's name that we put on those. Those, he should be swinging a tennis racket in Mario Tennis Aces. He should be driving a Mario Kart. Here, I think, is the um, difficulty for Tatanka is who would be his doubles partner? Ooh, this is a great question. Who is Tatanga's doubles partner? Jeez, uh, what else? Uh, what else is in space? Uh, do we give him like Zoda? I think it might. Would it be Zoda? Which from, Zoda? Uh, Star Tropics. <laughs> uh, I love that. It'll never happen. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, my T is also Tatanga, um, uh, and then my U is the Upside Dizzy Galaxy from Super Mario Galaxy 2. This is one of those um, two-dimensional galaxies um, where uh, there are, all over the place, there are, like, forced gravities. Like, it's showing you that the gravity is up here, the gravity is down, the gravity is left, the gravity is right. Um, it is sort of the uh, logical conclusion to how messed up you can make a 2D Mario experience um, just by messing with the gravity. Um, and, you know, Galaxy does this a, a couple times where it makes really compelling, um, like, 2D segments um, and just sort of, like, drops them in the game. There's no, like, uh, you know, pomp and circumstance around it like there is in Mario Odyssey. Um, but, like, just low-key, they're really good 2D Mario levels. Um, and Upside Dizzy Galaxy is, is one, of, one of the best examples. My U is UFOs in Breath of the Wild. Um, so B- Breath of the Wild is a game that really captured my imagination. And one of the things that was really fun around the time that that game was coming out was just like getting to learn more about the development of that game. Um, I think it was a games uh, GDC at like the Games Developers Conference that they had like a long, uh, like a large panel where they went fairly in depth into like the design philosophy of the game. And they also showed off some, you know, like early concept art or some early work that was done in the game that didn't end up making the final cut. And one of the ideas that was like um, one of like the prototypes was this idea of like UFOs that would come out of the sky and they were like really large spaceships and they would like suck up cows into yeah. like the spaceship. And I, uh, one, I think that's just like such a funny idea, but two, um, it really just like lit fires in my imagination. Like the, I obviously like game working in games can be very challenging, but, um, you know, working on something like breath of the wild, feels like it would be like so much fun and potentially like so rewarding at the end of it to be a, to like uh the like mechanics of that game are so precise and they kind of have to be because everything is based like all the puzzle solving is based on physics and all that kind of stuff but um because it's such like a vast world like all of these could have beens are really fun to like think about yeah and it's also a game that's so big that like any could have been you're almost like but is that secretly in there somewhere? Like, is, is <laughs> yeah, it there somewhere totally. we just haven't found it yet? Um, <laughs> the idea of UFOs in a Zelda game um, always makes me excited uh, for someday, man. Someday there has to be a science fiction based Zelda game, right? Where like Zelda is a space princess and like all of the different areas of we're in the Hyrule system and you know there's a forest planet called like Kokiri and there's a water planet where the Zora live and you know like just and you know Link is like a robot or something that's like reborn every time it dies and like they pump a new one off the assembly line. Um, 
and you know he's got a lightsaber probably <laughs> um but you know just like the uh, the game seems so like ripe for that uh for stapling that um facade on it uh, i would really love to see a, a sci-fi zelda game that that would be super cool uh Okay. So that brings me to V, which is uh the various suit. Um good old various suit. This is suit. of course, yeah, this is of course Samus's um kind of like the main armor that uh you know Samus. That is the various that is the various suit. Um a lot of times like she gets it taken away in the, early in the game, she has to like earn pieces of it back. Uh but yeah, it's uh iconic Metroid gear. One of the things I really liked about uh, the various suit in its first appearance in, ooh, I'm going to say its first appearance in Super Metroid, but it may actually first appear in Metroid 2, um, but most iconically in, uh, in Super Metroid, um, that she's not wearing it when she starts. She's wearing like the sort of base suit. And one of the uh, like big signifiers, one of the things that you can see just by looking at her that she's wearing the various suit is that her shoulders have become huge. <laughs> uh, her shoulders become these like big bulbous things that like I don't it's not like a design element that you see in like armor or space armor ever. Um, like that is unique to Samus. Um, and it, it, I don't know. It's just it's uh, that's such a rare thing for a uh a concept that is so sort of like pat and like all over sci-fi is like you know some kind of like space marine bounty hunter thing um but no one has the armor like samus does she's the only one yeah like it is interesting we've talked about you know how metroid is so much a pastiche of uh like popular sci-fi of the day including like the alien franchise but yeah like the the armor feels very unique like i don't know that i've ever seen that almost kind of like ball and socket yeah you know, type like design the, like it doesn't seem like they took it from anywhere that's super obvious and i haven't seen that like cribbed by other pl- people either yeah because like you can see like her halo sort of or her her halo her helmet sort of looks like the uh the doom guy's helmet which also then sort of looks like the uh master chief's helmet um like they're all you know they're all different but like they're kind of just variations of the same thing those big old shoulders she's the only one who's got them how late 80s early 90s big shoulder pads <laughs> yeah but even then they're not like big round globes of shoulder <laughs> um so uh my v is venom the final evil planet in every star fox game this is always where andros is hanging out um another place another planet that doesn't seem uh pleasant at all i don't know if he is based there for purely military reasons but it seems like no one would want to live there maybe he grew up there i don't know um but it, it seems it's always a place where like the you know the skies are acidic and like uh you know the army can't follow Star Fox in there because like there are too many guns and too much like horrible fire on the ground um it is truly a nightmare world but you gotta go you gotta go in every game yeah, I guess it's like an exegol situation, right? Like, yes. you you put your base there because you know, like, it's dangerous and people can't get to it. And so, like, you're probably more protected. Look, if I'm a bad guy, I'm putting my, uh, like, military base on a planet nobody's going to want to go to. Yeah. But then once I've, like, su- successfully taken over the world, then I'm, like, setting up shop on the nice planet. Right. Well, first you blow up a couple of nice planets because like Alderaan, <laughs> right, right, right. Alderaan's probably pretty nice. <laughs> you have to you have to eat your villain vegetables That's by right. you know like being on venom, and then eventually you blow up a corn area yep. and you know you end up in one of like the nicer planets. You in blow the long up Kajimi for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, my uh, my W. I'm staying in the world of Star Fox and in the world of villains. Uh, and this is my second member of Star Wolf that I am bringing up on this list because I previously brought up the great Leon. Uh, but this is Wolf O'Donnell, um, who, of course, has a, a last name just as Irish as Fox McCloud. <laughs> That's why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, Wolf O'Donnell is also my choice for W. And I just love the fact that like people in the Star Fox universe are Irish for whatever yeah, reason. I, I love it. Sure. Yeah, totally. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, it, the, the thing that's further hilarious about it is that it means that Wolf and Fox are just named 
uh, the species they are. Like, that's just their first <laughs> name, right? Like, Peppy Hare is named Hare. That's his last name. And it's like, okay, well, that makes sense. You are a hare. So you're like, of a family of hares. Slippy Toad, same mm-hmm. deal. <laughs> but with Fox, and Fox, we meet his father. His father's name is James. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he just names his son Fox. Like, what's uh, what's Wolf's father's name? Like, Bill? Like, what what's going on in this universe? My that which brings us to X and yes. my X is the X parasite. Mark, from we are we Metroid are Metroid Fusion in sync again. <laughs> <laughs> this makes sense though. It gets harder at the end of the alphabet. Why did you pick the X parasite? Um, be, uh, well, frankly, because it's an X that I like knew from a Nintendo sci-fi. Very good series, but but I actually like Metroid Fusion a lot. It uh, I think like way back in the early days of the podcast when we did our rankings of the best Metroid games, um, I think that Fusion did decently. Um, it's it, tough. The, the top of that list is uh, fierce competition. There's Zero Mission, there's Super Metroid, and there's Metroid Prime. Like those are those are tough games to compete against. Yeah, but uh, no, the X Parasite is interesting just because it like is a diff- It's a different threat than the Metroid, right? Yes. It's like taking that point in like the Metroid series when they're introducing like a new threat that's all um, that's like almost more dangerous in a way than the metroid themselves yeah I, and I, I also like that it creates a uh, a copy of samus sort of like continuing this idea that was um i guess sort of happening at the exact same time in metroid prime 2 right um of there being a dark samus and of course dark samus is now um, a playable character in Smash Brothers. Where's my ex parasite, Samus? Hello. <laughs> um, but yeah, just like carrying this idea forward that like there is a um, a manifested dark side to Samus or like evil version of her. Um, one of the things that I find just absolutely fascinating about that character and like if anyone ever gave me like the reins to like write her in the future, um, one of the things that it, it just that her. Her physical body, her being, uh, like, is just slowly being absorbed by, uh, you know, like, the phazon particles in uh, Prime um, and by this uh, ex-parasite that, like, she just gives up pieces of herself um, to fight these, like, never-ending wars against, like, biological weapons in this universe, um, which is all very interesting to me. And I would just like to see, like, what happens as, like, bit by bit every piece of her is uh, corrupted or replaced or uh, mechanized or whatever. Um, and the X-Parasite is, like, the beginning of that. Yeah, and I, well, the other thing I've, I, I kind of like about the X-Parasite is that the, like, canonically... They are the reason that the Chozo created the Metroid species, um, like because they were trying to oh, yeah. wipe out the the X parasite. And so um, I I feel like for whatever reason, and I can't really put my finger on specific examples of this, but I feel like a lot of times in um, sci-fi series, right, you've like seen the same enemy for a while. I mean, I guess maybe they did this a little bit in Prometheus, uh, again on that like alien train. But the idea where it's like, okay, we've had this like one threat for so long. So what do we introduce to like um kind of like one up that threat? And like uh, kind of amazingly, the X virus, like the X parasite, is an example of them introducing that, but like successfully, to my mind anyways, into yeah. like the canon of uh Metroid. Yeah, and so so it ends up not feeling like in Jurassic World when they need the original T-Rex to fight the Spinosaurus or what? No, it's not even a Spinosaurus. It's whatever. That's the made-up dinosaur that, that they yeah. made. Um, where it's like, the only thing bad enough to take on our new bad guy is the old bad guy. <laughs> Mark, my why is... Uh, this was a difficult one for me. So I, I punted. It's Yellow Pikmin for me. <laughs> <laughs> the Yellow Pikmin conduct elect- uh, electricity... Um, they are like small and skinny and like all Pikmin, um, are hilarious when you see them like running around and like hurting themselves. Um, but they have the added benefit of, uh, you put one of them next to a battery and you put the other one next to a light switch and you make them hold hands and, uh, that light is going to turn on. 
yeah, I mean, hard to argue with the yellow Pikmin. My why is why can't Metroid crawl? Oh. <laughs> So why uh, why can't Metroid crawl is uh, an internet meme from that originated on the Miiverse. There was a person who was playing Metroid presumably for the first time um, and came to like a, a wall where it seemed like you had to like crouch down. Of it's course, it's like the uh, first wall that you encounter in the game. <laughs> uh, you know, like you are supposed to turn into what are they called? Like a power ball or something? Yeah, um, the, the morph ball. Morph ball. Morph ball, yeah. So you can like turn into the morph ball and uh, roll through that like uh, that tunnel. But uh, how would you necess- like know that? I guess there's no like logical reason that you should. And uh, and so why uh, can't Metroid crawl became a meme throughout 2013, um, and just like reminding me of the good old days of Meverse. Uh, it's also just beautiful, too, because it, 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 you know, in addition to asking the question, which is like, well, just wait, you'll find a thing that you can like roll through there. Um, like there, there are several levels of absurdity to it, right? There's the one where it's like, well, just play the game a little bit and you'll discover what how this actually works. But then also like a- admonishing someone for being like, no, you idiot, you turn into a ball and roll under it is insane. Uh, but then beyond that, uh, that character is not called Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy mistake to make. Easy mistake yeah. to make. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a real, uh, you know, playing as Zelda uh, in the Zelda game. It's kind of, kind of, error to make. And finally, uh, Z, man, I, like this one, I also feel like I punted on. Uh, I, of course, did a Zello um, Pikmin. No, I'm just kidding. I did uh, Zebus <laughs> uh, or Zebes. I'm not, I always said Zebes, but I think it is probably Zebus. Yeah, you you and me both. I I also <laughs> said I also said Zebes. Uh, yes, this is the planet where most of the uh, action in the Metroid games um, takes place. The first game, the third game, for sure. Um, you don't go to uh, Zebus in any of the Prime games, do you? I don't think so, but I, I wouldn't so like swear on it. Um, yep, it's just sort of a uh, uh, like that's that's where the action takes place. It's a a. Uh, biologically diverse environment um it's got uh you know giant underwater areas it's got a jungle um and a lot of fiery caves home to uh Craid and ridley so <laughs> <laughs> uh all right um my z to conclude this uh and this is where mark i this is where i was feeling like a little bit of a stinker here did you know that StarCraft 64 was published by Nintendo and is therefore no, I did not a know. Nintendo game for the purposes of this conversation. <laughs> but where does the Z come in? The Zerg! Oh, of course. Of course. One, one of the uh, three main factions in that game, the Zerg. Um, they are, uh, again, look, everyone rips off Alien, right? So they're, they're an Alien ripoff uh, and they're cool. Um, and, uh, that's, that, that's my Z. Um, I would talk more about it, but I don't really know StarCraft that well. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a great one. Um, especially getting on there on a, like a technicality, but a beautiful technicality. Um, I, you know, why is StarCraft, why, like, I know it's a beloved franchise. It is interesting to me that we have not seen like a, uh, I know that they still update the game. And I well, know Star- that, StarCraft you know, 2, I... they still update, right? Well, and they, didn't so you're they right, you're the, right, like, sorry. Didn't they do, like, StarCraft Classic um, not that long ago? Yeah, I don't you know. Don't really it know just, I, like, <laughs> no, but I'm just wondering, like, does the world, like, do we not care about, like, those, like, sign of, sort of, like, tactical games anymore? Um, why is Blizzard not making, like, a new StarCraft? Uh, I mean, that's, th- it's interesting, because, like, the whole like craft uh thing um you know w- was originally warcraft um which you know just like starcraft is a real time strategy game and then when world of warcraft came out um that just demolished everything else like everything became world of warcraft um and i guess like hearthstone is sort of like a step back from that to like take the warcraft world and make like a virtual card game out of it um but i feel like I don't know. Starcraft is such a 
um, like eSport, right? Like uh, it is uh, so big in those circles that I feel like they know that any future StarCraft game just has to function along those lines, right? So like, will we see a StarCraft 3? Maybe someday. Um, but will we ever see Nintendo take it upon themselves to take a real-time strategy game and port it to <laughs> their their home console uh, and replace the mouse and keyboard controls with the N64 <laughs> analog stick and, I don't know, a Z button? Um, and <laughs> try to make that whole thing work. It seems like lunacy. There were so many things missing from... Uh, the Nintendo 64 version of StarCraft, um, you know, entire missions um, and just like tons and tons of features. Uh, and it just, uh, you know, ran at like a, an abysmal, like handful of frames per second. Um, so <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. That's wild. But they did it. They tried it. So props yeah. to them. <laughs> a good um, way to close it up. Yes, a good way to close it up. All right, Mark, we have done it. We have now done N through Z, the back half of a 26-letter alphabet. Nintendo Sci-Fi, A to Z. If there were any... This is a, a weird call-out, right? I was just going to say, if there were any letters that we could have done something better for... If Look, if you want to shout out some cool Nintendo Sci-Fi thing, you can just email us at NintendoCartridgeSociety at gmail.com. At gmail.com. Um, and we'll talk about it on the show. Um, Mark, do you think there's any uh, any big like sci-fi corners of the of the universe we left out? I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's like uh, something that I am just not familiar with. Like maybe uh, Mario Strikers takes place <laughs> in some weird, you know, like on the moon. alternate. But <laughs> yeah, like I I would never know. I mean, we didn't talk a lot about Galaxy. Um, we didn't talk about Damon X Machina or Astral Chain. Those mm, both have mm -hmm. like sci-fi elements. So like there's there's definitely more out there. Um, so I, I eagerly await uh, people correcting us or not correcting us, but uh, telling us some cool things that we left out. So that's your homework for the weekend. <laughs> Um, all right, that's going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you like this episode, please share it on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you share stuff. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I am at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell. And the show is at Named Card Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers saying, obviously, Tatanga's doubles partner is Wart. Let's get Wart in these games. And thanks for listening. Hey, Rachel, Oscar. Yeah, yeah Claire? Claire? Do you love Disney movies? Uh-huh. Have you seen them all? Not, Not all, all of them. them. What do you guys think if we watch them all in chronological order and then talk about them? Ooh. Oh, and what if we could talk about it with some of our favorite friends? <gasps> I love that. Yeah. And what if we do it inside the Disney Vault? You know, that's the name of our podcast, Inside the Disney Vault on Campfire Media. Yeah. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. That's Inside the Disney Vault. Let's go. Woo! Campfire.